Hello, beautiful bookworms. And welcome to a very festive edition of Squirrel's Bookshelf. I'm Jess, head squirrel, and as you can see, the library has been decorated for the holiday season. We do celebrate Christmas in our household, and one of our favorite things to do throughout the wintry season is to curl up with some hot cocoa and watch our favorite Christmas films. But I'm not just here to talk about films, oh no, this is a bookish channel. So instead, let's take a look at some of the books that inspired those classic Christmas films. Let's start with the oldest book on my list, which is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, the timeless tale of a man named Ebenezer Scrooge who is the living antithesis to the spirit of Christmas. But of course, after Scrooge is visited on the night of Christmas Eve by three spirits, he turns around his attitude and becomes the embodiment of kindness and generosity. Charles Dickens wrote this story over the course of just six weeks, from mid-October to December 2nd, beginning the task in the grip of a hideous cold that has taken possession of me to an almost unprecedented extent, as he told a friend. But Dickens was determined to write, despite his illness and despite the fact that he was in the midst of writing the 11th installment of Martin Chuzzlewit. Part of that drive was fueled by the financial stresses he was feeling, not only within his immediate family, but also witnessing his father's endless borrowing and pleas for money. But Dickens wrote on, averaging two to two and a half manuscript pages a day, which is about 1,400 to over 2,200 words a day. The character of Scrooge relied heavily on a minor character he'd developed for the Pickwick Papers, Gabriel Grubb, which did help propel his writing. Finally, on December 19, 1843, Chapman and Hall published Dickens' Little Christmas Book. Its full original title was A Christmas Carol, in prose, being a ghost story of Christmas. The book was divided into five staves, like five verses of a carol or song, and featured illustrations by John Leach. The first run of 6,000 copies sold out by Christmas Eve, so two more editions were released that same month, with 13 editions released in total by the end of the following year. In other words, it was popular! Unfortunately, despite its popularity, Dickens didn't do so well financially out of it. This was owing to two main factors, one being his insistence on a higher production quality. He wanted four full-page hand-colored etchings, a feat which he would not repeat. Also touches like full gilt edges and a gilt decoration on the front board and the spine. Of course, many of us collectors nowadays probably would thank him for all of these fine touches, but it did narrow his margins considerably. But his second problem was having to file a lawsuit against another publishing company who illicitly produced a cheap pirated version of his story called A Christmas Ghost Story. While he did successfully acquire a court injunction due to copyright infringement winning the lawsuit, the other publisher ultimately just filed bankruptcy and Dickens was forced to then pay the 700 pounds in court fees. An awful lot of money in the mid-19th century. Interestingly enough, the publication in question, which came from Parley's Illuminated Library, did undergo a title change between between the injunction and declaring bankruptcy. Instead of a Christmas ghost story, it became a genuine ghost story, in brackets, not by Charles Dickens. And that's a true story. Despite Dickens' own financial struggles, anyone nowadays in possession of an early copy of A Christmas Carol, let alone a first edition, could be sitting on a small fortune. At the time of its release, A Christmas Carol cost five shillings, which today is about 24 pounds or 32 US dollars. Nowadays, depending on condition, you could be looking at anywhere from a couple of grand to over 50 grand for a first edition. Even early reprints can fetch hundreds. Luckily, for those of us unlikely to afford even an early edition, there do exist some facsimile prints, such as this one here. This particular one was produced in 2012, but there are several of them out there. Another fun copy I have for anyone who's interested is this edition that I happened to get from the Charles Dickens Birthplace Museum here in England, but it is available elsewhere too, and it's the original manuscript edition of A Christmas Carol. It's a copy of Dickens' handwritten manuscript of the story, which is usually on display for the holiday season at the Morgan Library and Museum in Manhattan. Each turn of the page reveals Dickens' original manuscript on one side with all his edits and deletions, and a typeset transcription on the other with which to follow along. There is a notable omission from the original manuscript, the sentence in the penultimate paragraph which reads, and to Tiny Tim, who did not die. This wasn't in his original manuscript. 
This, in fact, was added later during the printing process. A Christmas Carol is one that most of us know pretty well, in part due to all the adaptations and film versions of the story. I will admit that my first exposure to A Christmas Carol was through the film The Muppet Christmas Carol, which is not only still my favorite adaptation of the story to this day, but is indeed one of my top favorite Christmas films of all time. Admittedly, I was confused when I later read the book and discovered there's only one Marley and not two, but who doesn't love Waldorf and Statler? <laughs> but beyond the prolific film adaptations, this story has had a huge impact on our culture as a whole in more ways than you probably realize. We've gained cultural vocabulary such as bah humbug or calling someone a Scrooge, which by the way was invented as an onomatopoeic combination of screw and gouge. Lovely, right? And while Dickens of course didn't invent the phrase Merry Christmas, its use in A Christmas Carol reinvigorated its popular use that still continues to this day. Even more so, A Christmas Carol is a huge reason why many of us still celebrate Christmas so extravagantly today. Up until the early 19th century, Christmas wasn't actually all that common. But with a revival of interest in Christmas carols and Queen Victoria popularizing the Christmas tree, that started to change. The instant popularity of Dickens' novella only reinforced that newly growing interest in the Christmas season, and Dickens himself had an enormous interest in Christmas. A fun fact I uncovered while researching for this video was that Dickens' interest in Christmas was partially inspired by a book called The Sketches of Geoffrey Crayon, Gent, by Washington Irving. Amidst this originally two-volume collection are two stories you've probably heard of, Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, but it also contains four essays on Old English Christmas traditions. They were titled Christmas, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and The Christmas Dinner. And these essays are one of the reasons that Dickens would go on to write not only A Christmas Carol, but several other short stories inspired by Christmas. Not to mention the four additional Christmas novellas that Dickens would write after A Christmas Carol, owing to the increasing public demand for more Christmas stories. Those stories were The Chimes, The Cricket, and The Hearth, The Battle of Life, and The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain. Today, Dickens' five Christmas novellas are usually referred to as the Christmas books. In short, we owe a lot to Charles Dickens for bringing back to life so many Christmas traditions that we hold near and dear. Traditions of giving as well as receiving, of helping those less fortunate, and of spending quality time eating well with loved ones. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about the creation of A Christmas Carol, a great dramatic retelling that I would recommend is the film The Man Who Invented Christmas. Moving exactly 100 years forward, this next book may not sound familiar to you, but the film it inspired is still regarded today as one of the classic Christmas films of the 20th century. It is The Greatest Gift, A Christmas Story by Philip Van Doren Stern. This short story follows George Pratt, a suicidal man who is suddenly faced with what the world would look like if he were never born. This story would ultimately serve as the inspiration for the film It's a Wonderful Life, but it didn't find success easily. The idea first struck Van Doren Stern in a dream in February of 1938. His notes apparently detailed how the complete story came to him from start to finish, an unusual occurrence as any writer will tell you. However, his experience with writing was based solely in nonfiction, with many works about the American Civil War. He had never written fiction before, and he was all too aware of his shortcomings in that arena. He wrote his first draft of The Greatest Gift in April 1938, which he described himself as, quote, pretty terrible. So he put the story away for a few years until, in the spring of 1943, he rewrote the story and showed it to his agent. Although his agent apparently liked the story, it was too much a fantasy story for any magazine to want to buy it. But Van Doren Stern had grown fond of his little story that no one seemed to want, so he had 200 copies privately printed at his own expense. These short 24-page booklets were bound in orange covers and sent out to his friends as Christmas cards. A few months later, in March of 1943, Van Dorn Stern received a Western Union telegram from his agent telling him that film rights had been sought for his story. He was ecstatic. 
You see, the story somehow worked its way to RKO Pictures producer David Hempstead, who proceeded to purchase the film rights for $50,000. But after three failed attempts at writing a script, Hempstead decided to instead show the story to Oscar-winning director Frank Capra. Now Capra had just come back from fighting in the war and was terrified of making a new film, but this felt like just the story he'd been waiting for his entire life. A story, as he described it, slight in the sense of short, but not slight in content. RKO sold the rights to Frank Capra's production company, and the resulting film, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, premiered on December 20th, 1946. Both Capra and Stewart would later describe the film as their favorite they ever worked on, and all because of Endor and Stern's story. Now, the filmmakers polished and expanded the plot quite a bit. They changed the lead character's name to George Bailey, and they changed the stranger character to Clarence the Guardian Angel, but the heart of the story was still exactly as it was originally written. Now, between the film rights being sold and the film actually premiering, the story was finally commercially published. It appeared in two magazines, the December 1944 issue of Reader's Scope and the January 1945 issue of Good Housekeeping under the title The Man Who Is Never Born. Then, in December of 1944, it was published in book form by David McKay in New York. At the time, the book cost one single dollar, but now it's worth a solid four figures, especially if you have the original blue dust jacket. As for the original privately printed booklet, only seven of the 200 copies are still known to exist today. So best of luck finding one of those, let alone being able to afford it. The next classic on Santa's list is Miracle on 34th Street. Now this is a slight exception to this list as the story didn't originally exist in book form, but rather was released as a novella in conjunction with the premiere of the original 1947 film. Its author, Valentine Davis, actually outlined the story as a screenplay idea first. The idea came to him while serving as a Coast Guard officer in 1944. It was during the annual pre-Christmas rush and he just noticed that commercialism was dominating true Christmas spirit. And it occurred to him if Santa Claus really existed, he'd walk into a modern department store and be, quote, a pretty disillusioned old boy. Thus began the story of Kris Kringle, an elderly gentleman who so authentically played Santa Claus in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and subsequently in Macy's flagship New York store that he inspired a skeptical little girl and her mother to believe in him. Davis showed the outline of his story to his wife, who inspired him to flesh out the story and send it to an old friend at 20th Century Fox, George Seaton. The story then moved up to the Fox executives who decided to make a film of it and they had Seaton write the screenplay. While the film was underway, another friend of Davis forwarded the story to the publisher Harcourt Brayson Company. Harcourt's editor-in-chief, Robert Giraud, told Davis, this is the best Christmas story since Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and proceeded to work with Davis to novelize the story. Harcourt had a bit of a rush, pushing the publication to release at the same time as the film. Within months, the book was on bestseller lists, and the film went on to win three Oscars, one of which went to Davis himself, for the best original story. It seemed that post-war America was keen for some good old-fashioned Christmas spirit, as are a lot of us still today. Next up is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Dr. Seuss's classic children's book about the solitary creature called the Grinch, who despises and tries to ruin Christmas for all of Whoville. That is, until little Cindy Lou Who teaches him about the joy of Christmas, and his heart grows three times in size. The character of the Grinch first appeared in May 1955 as a 32-line illustrated poem called The Hoobub and the Grinch in Red Book magazine. A couple of years later, after Dr. Seuss had written The Cat in the Hat, and as he was working on founding the beginner books with his wife, he decided to write a book version. How the Grinch Stole Christmas was then published both in the October 12, 1957 issue of Red Book magazine and as a book published by Random House on November 24, 1957. Of course, course, there are now a few film adaptations so far, a couple of animated ones, and the live-action one starring Jim Carrey. Next up is In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash, a novel comprised of semi-autobiographical stories written by Gene Shepard and the basis for the 1983 film A Christmas Story. Now, the film is a masterpiece of iconic and hysterical vignettes surrounding a young boy named Ralphie Parker in his hometown of Homan, Indiana and his ultimate Christmas wish of owning an official Red Rider Carbon Action 200 shot range model air rifle. Living in the UK for the past nearly four years, 
I've come to sadly realize that this film isn't extremely popular over here, but of course in the States it has very much become a cult classic. In fact, this is easily the most quoted film in my family year round. No, shoot your eye out. You used up all the glue on purpose. Big good boy, show mommy, mommy had the big easy. Fragile. It must be Italian. It was? Yes. Soup. Poisoning. Oh. Uh, My parents actually got to visit the Christmas Story house in Cleveland where they shot the film, which is now a museum for the film. Naturally, a staple of our household is the 24-hour marathon running in the background every Christmas. For those of you outside the States, I feel I must explain. Apologies for the short tangent. In 1997, the American TV channel TNT began airing a 24-hour marathon of A Christmas Story, beginning on the evening of Christmas Eve. And when I say marathon, I mean split screen of the end credits next to the opening titles every time. Now, I believe this was actually put in place to give the folks that worked at the studio a chance to take Christmas off, which, if is true, makes the story even better. The tradition was taken over by TNT's sister network, TBS, and still continues to this day. Anyway, the screenplay was taken from five key stories, four of which were found in this book, plus one additional story about the Bumpus Hounds from another Gene Shepard novel, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories, and other disasters. Also, the bully's name, Scott Farkas, came from a story in this book, although that story has absolutely nothing to do with the Christmas story. But man, that's a good name, isn't it? Scott, Scott Farkas, what, what a rotten, rotten name. name. That said, these books are not where the stories originated. The author, Jane Shepard, was a radio presenter, so naturally he told his stories over his radio broadcasts, which actually makes a lot of sense seeing as Jane Shepard actually narrated the film. Then, starting in June 1964, he began adapting some of his radio stories into print with help from author and poet Shel Silverstein, whom you may know as the author of Where the Sidewalk Ends, The Giving Tree, and more. These stories were then first published in Playboy magazine in the mid to late 1960s. This does include a few of the stories that lent themselves to a Christmas story. The two Christmas story tales that ended up in In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash were Grover Dill and the Tasmanian Devil from the September 1964 issue and Red Rider Nails the Cleveland Street Kid from the December 1965 issue. The Bumpus Hound story from Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories also originated in Playboy in the April 1969 issue, as well as the story containing Scott Farkas in the April 1967 issue. Shepard then compiled these stories into two novels, which were then published by Doubleday in 1966 and 1971. On a side note, the remaining stories in here did inspire a sequel film called My Summer Story. But if you are only interested in a Christmas story and you want to read the original five stories that inspired it in one volume, a standalone Christmas story book was published in 2003 and it does make an excellent Christmas gift. This next one might be the least well known on my list, but Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas is certainly a classic in my family. If you're a fellow Emmett Otter fan, please do show your love in the comments. This children's book was published in 1971 by Parents Magazine Press and was written by Russell Hoban and illustrated by his wife Lillian Hoban. The book later inspired a 1977 Jim Henson puppeteered television special. Now, the film originally contained an introduction and some narration by Kermit the Frog, but due to the Muppets being bought out by the Walt Disney Company, some versions may or may not have Kermit. If you haven't seen it though, it is the sweetest story about a young otter and his mother who are very poor, but despite that, secretly try to buy each other Christmas gifts. They both enter the same talent show in the hopes of using the prize money to buy each other a special Christmas present. But the catch is they must each sacrifice something connected to the other person's livelihood in order to be able to enter the show in the first place. It is a twist on the 1905 short story by O. Henry called The Gift of the Magi. Two things I was overjoyed to discover were, number one, how much the imagery in the film was taken directly from the book from the puppets to their costumes and their sets. And two, that two of the songs written by Paul Williams for the film were directly inspired by the book, The Bathing Suit That Your Grandma Otter Wore, and Downstream When the River Meets the Sea. If you haven't seen it, I implore you to immediately track it down and watch it. Or of course, read the book. 
For another film based on a children's book, we have The Snowman by Raymond Briggs. Now this one is unusual in both the book and the film as the story is entirely silent. This children's book, published in 1978, first by Hamish Hamilton in the UK and then later that year by Random House in the US, has no words. Instead, the colored pencil illustrations alone tell the story of a young boy's fantastic adventures in the night when the snowman he built comes to life. Now, Briggs has stated that this book was partially inspired by a previous work of his, Fungus the Bogeyman. Now, in some ways, this strikes me as the British equivalent of Emmett Otter, in that it was also developed into a television special that has become quite the tradition in the UK. I know it's my husband's favorite film of the Christmas season, largely due to the music. The music plays a huge role in the film. As the book had no words, the film likewise has no dialogue, so it relies entirely on the visuals and the music to guide the story along. The film is also a fantastic visual adaptation of the book, being animated in the same exact colored pencil style of the book. Now, to mark the 30th anniversary of the film, producers got Briggs' permission to write a sequel in 2012 called The Snowman and the Snow Dog, which is also lovely, although I do warn you, if you're a dog lover, you may want to bring a box of tissues with you. The final book inspiration on my Christmas list is The Polar Express, written and illustrated by Chris Van Allsburg. Published by Houghton Mifflin in 1985, this children's book tells the story of a boy who isn't sure whether he believes in Santa Claus until he boards the magical Polar Express train on Christmas Eve, which takes him up to the North Pole to meet the big man himself. When asked where the story came from, Van Allsburg said, I had this idea, this mental image of a young boy who hears a strange sound in the middle of the night and he goes outside. It's a very foggy, misty night. He walks through these woods and sees a train standing still, just sitting in this kind of fog. Where is it going to go? Well, there are a lot of places a train could go and take a child, but where would a child want to go more than anywhere else? As I reflected on this mysterious train, it occurred to me that it must be a cold night because the engine's steam is heavy. It might even be winter. Maybe some snow is falling. Perhaps it's December, close to Christmas or even Christmas Eve. Then I asked myself the question again, where would a child want to go more than anywhere else on Christmas Eve. According to Van Allsburg, The Polar Express was the easiest children's picture book manuscript to write, requiring only one draft with minimal changes. His illustrations, made with oil pastels, were influenced by the 19th century German artist Caspar David Friedrich, whose panoramic works featured single small figures. The book was a hit, appearing on the New York Times bestseller list, a rare feat for a children's picture book. This exact copy has been in my mom's book collection since I was a little kid, so I definitely knew this one before the 2004 film came out. Now, Van Allsburg was no stranger to having his work adapted to the big screen. Another story you'll probably know of his is Jumanji. Van Allsburg actually served as executive producer for The Polar Express, which was directed by Robert Zemeckis and starred Tom Hanks in several roles. The film was animated in a unique way using live action performance capture. Now, at the film's premiere, Van Allsburg revealed a fun Fun fact about the Polar Express's engine. It was inspired by an engine he used to play on when he was a child, the Paramarquette 1225, which used to be on display. The number 1225 was another inspiration for the story because in his mind, that translated to the American dating system 1225 or December 25th. Christmas. An added bonus was that all of the train sounds in the film, apart from the whistle, actually came from the original 1225 engine itself. And that generally wraps up this video apart from one last honorable mention. This last one doesn't really qualify for this list, as there was no written form to the story before or even in conjunction with the film's release. But The Nightmare Before Christmas is certainly a cult classic worth mentioning. It was originally conceived as a poem by Tim Burton, so it technically did exist on paper well before the film's creation. And in light of the 30th anniversary of the film, in 2013 that poem was published with Tim Burton's illustrations. This was an exclusive to Barnes & Noble, and it includes a DVD of the poem written by the late, great Christopher Lee. So if you're a fan, this book is a great one to have. And with that, my Christmas list is complete. If I missed any festive stories you want to learn more about, please do let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I wish everyone the happiest of holidays, whatever you celebrate. And as always, be kind, be curious, and be effective. Bye!
Grinch. A Christmas Carol by Car Carl. Yeah. Five of this list. <laughs> Men and original. <laughs>